Good morning. We are humbled and excited to be here with you today. So glad that you invited us to be here today. We have been married 37 years. <laughs> just, just to let you know, I'm going backwards here. There we go. There's nothing more exciting, in my opinion, than gathering with the church and praising God. And so I'm glad you're here, I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad we're here together to have this opportunity. But I'm also glad that God gave us this opportunity. Here in Acts chapter 10, if you look at that scripture, it, it talks about a turning point in the church. It says, Then a voice told him, speaking to Peter, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. You know, I'm sure you can look back on your life and you can remember situations or decisions that became turning points in your life that changed the way things were. Abraham Lincoln noticed or recognized the, in the Gettysburg Address that the battle at Gettysburg was a turning point of sorts for our country. He said that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from earth. He recognized that as a turning point. A chance to bring the country back together and not be divided. One of the greatest turning points that affects all of our lives happened long before any of us were even thought of. And that's when God required, if you will, the gospel to be taken to the Gentiles. Because friends, that's who we are. We are the Gentiles. And that was the turning point for all of us. So today I want to look at, at three turning points within the church that occurred when Peter was called to go preach the gospel to Cornelius. First of all, there was a turning point in relationships. One thing that we know for sure is that God prepared Peter. That's one thing we need to remember. When we think of evangelism, we think of things we want to do. People need to be prepared. People need to understand what it's going to be all about. Peter was a good Jewish man, a good follower of the law. And now God is preparing him to change the way that he thinks. You know, a devout Jew could not enter the house or even touch the possessions of a Gentile, let alone eat or drink with them because they'd become unclean, ceremonially, of course. And so this is the reason for Peter's vision. This is the reason that, that God lowers this sheet. Let's look again at Acts chapter 10. And verses 11 and 12, and it says, He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice commands him to eat. That shocks Peter. That shocks Peter, because he looks up there and he sees what he's been taught his whole life as unclean animals. I, I can't eat those. I can't do it. 
Peter's thinking, maybe this is a test. Maybe this is a test to see if I really am as strong as, as I think I am. But then, in verse 15, it says, The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made. So God took this time to prepare Peter. I mean, the Jews looked at the Gentiles as unclean. And so God's telling Peter, don't call anything I've created unclean or impure. Saying, you need to change your mind about some things. But not only had God prepared Peter... He's preparing Cornelius as well. He's preparing Cornelius for what's about to happen. Think of Cornelius. We know that he was a devout man. He prayed. He was very kind to the Jews around him. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 3, it says, One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision, Cornelius. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. I love the way Cornelius responds. He says, What is it, Lord? Right away. What is it, Lord? Instead of questioning what he's seeing and who are you, what are you doing here? What is it, Lord? Right away, his mind goes to this is God speaking to me. I imagine Cornelius was going about his daily life. He never expected to see an angel. I mean, we never expect to see an angel, right? We never do. But Cornelius did, and this, he's there for a reason. He's there to prepare Cornelius for what he needs to do. He's given the instructions. He's told, there is a man named Peter staying in Joppa. You need to send for him and have him come to you. Bring him to your house. Now, the first thing Cornelius does is be obedient. But you think about this. You think of Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4. When Jesus asks her for a cup of water, what's her reaction? Not, okay, I'll give you a drink. Why are you talking to me? You're a Jewish man, I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you talking to me? You know, Cornelius could have said, Why would I want to send for this man when I know he won't come to my house? I know that he won't. He's a Jew, I'm a Gentile. But he didn't. He was obedient to God. This tells us something about the relationship that Cornelius had with God being a Gentile. And I think that's important to understand that, that he was obedient to the instructions. Now, the Gentiles are coming to the Jews. They're coming and turning to them to see them, to associate with them for the sake of receiving the gospel. You know, this can be humbling. With the battle between the two, if you will, between the two races, now all of a sudden, these groups that despise one another or you're not one of us, has to turn to a group that sometimes just acted like they were superior to everybody else. We're God's people. 
But now, the, these Gentiles are turning to the Jews, and, and it just amazes me. Cornelius does it willingly. Friends, this reminds us that when we see something we need to do in, in our spiritual life, something that's going to draw us closer to God, we need to humble ourselves and do it. We need to listen to what God is saying to us so that we are able to do what it is He wants us to do. And friends, we always need to be humble before God. Always. What kind of response do you think these three men that Cornelius sent to go to Peter expected? Along the road, you can imagine them talking. How's he going to react? What's he going to say to us? Is he going to shut the door in our face? Will he even come out and talk to us? Well, in Acts chapter 10, in verse 22, when they get to talk to Peter, it says, The men replied, We've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous man and a God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him, to have you come by his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Well, they'd have to be pleasantly surprised. I mean, remember, Peter was up on the roof in the middle of his vision, hungry, God telling him to eat, him saying, no, I'm not going to. When these men arrive at the house and ask for him, Peter began to put it together. And so he goes down and speaks to them and they, they tell them, tell Peter, here is our purpose for being here. And I like what this verse tells us about Cornelius, how he is respected by all the Jews. This tells us the kind of man that he is. He's a good man. He's a man who people like. He's a man who people care about. You know, I often wonder how Simon the Tanner felt seeing these men at his gate. And then Peter, a guest in his house, invites these men in. Come on in and stay. We'll leave tomorrow. I mean, how's that make you feel? But see, it's all in God's hands. And Peter understood that. Peter understood that he was a messenger of God. And, and that's all he was going to do was take God's message. We see no malice. We see no mistrust of one another. We see these two races of people uniting under the obedience of one living God. The love of God is amazing. The things that God can do through us when we just listen to Him. When we humble ourselves. When we allow Him to work for us. So we see this, this turning point in relationships. Secondly, we see a, a turning point in the church. When Peter arrived at the house of Cornelius, he, Cornelius met them at the gate and bowed down to Peter, which seemed to be kind of a tradition when you think somebody is superior to you. But look at how Peter responds to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 26. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. I mean, I don't know what kind of reputation the apostles at this time still had throughout the area. But you think about it. Peter was one of the best friends of Jesus. Whenever the apostles are mentioned, Peter's number one. 
Peter's always the first one. And whenever Jesus takes any of the apostles with him, it's always Peter, James, and John. And of course, we know that, that John was the one that was referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. Probably his best friend in the whole world. But, but Peter was right up there. And maybe Cornelius realized this, and this is what caused him to bow. He knew why he had put Peter there, and why he had called for Peter. And so he was showing him a sign of respect. But Peter says, I'm just a man myself. And he understood that, that all people are created equal. Nobody's greater than anyone else. Even though there's people that think they're better. Peter knew, hey, I'm no better than this man. We're all created the same and God loves us all. He's realizing that from that vision. God loves all of His creation. Now, when we think about this understanding... Peter started to remind Cornelius in his teaching about the law of the Jews. However, he also explained how God had overruled it. I mean, everybody knew the, the different, difficult relationship between the Jews and about everybody else because of their, their laws, their food laws and all the other unclean and clean. So Peter explains to Cornelius in verse 28 of Acts 10, he said to them, you are well aware that it's against the law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Peter says, you know the law, you know what God says to us Jews, but now God has taken that away. God has changed that. And so now I'm here. So now it's Cornelius' turn to explain to Peter why he's there. Peter asked Cornelius, why would you send for me? And so Cornelius goes on to say, about three o'clock the other day I was in prayer and I had this vision. An angel appeared to me and told me to send for a, a man named Peter staying at the house of Simon the Tanner in Joppa on a street called Straight. Cornelius says the vision happened four days ago at this hour, three in the afternoon. Peter realizes at that hour what he was doing four days ago. He too was having a vision. I love what Cornelius says after this in verse 33 now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us Cornelius is saying we're ready we want to hear we want to be spiritually fed So please, so please, do what the Lord has asked you to do. So Peter begins to speak. Peter begins by recognizing that God offers salvation to all nations. Up to this time, the gospel had only been preached to the Jews. And this was a change for the church because now it was being open to the Gentiles. You know, up to this time, all the churches were made up of, of Jews who had believed in Jesus. 
And so now it's being opened up to the Gentiles. And Peter gave them a little bit of background on Jesus, refreshing their memories, because it was obvious that the fame and the name of Jesus was known throughout the land. So Jesus, get, or excuse me, Peter gives them a little bit of review on Jesus and his life and the things that were done to bring them up to speed. And then Peter attests to the physical resurrection of Jesus. In Acts chapter 10, verse 41, he says, He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with Him after He rose from the dead. This assures us, assured Cornelius, that this Jesus that people saw after the resurrection was physical. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't a spirit. Peter said, we ate and we drank with him. Spirits don't do that. That's only physical bodies that do that. And so Peter is telling Cornelius here, I assure you that this happened. I saw it with my own eyes and I shared a meal or two with him. And they understood that this was what it was all about. <clears throat> Excuse me. But remember, he said, not everybody saw him. There's a lot of commentators that say, that only those who believed could see him. I couldn't tell you. But there's the fact that Jesus has all power. He could have chosen who he wanted to witness this, who he wanted to see. I mean, after all, look on the road to Emmaus. Cleopas and his friend, they're walking along, and Jesus is walking with them, and they don't have any clue who he is until after they stop and they eat and he opens their eyes and they realize ah, that was Jesus with us all along. We were telling Jesus about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus has that power. But Peter's assuring Cornelius here, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead and I saw it. So it's a turning point in God's promise to mankind. I mean, if you remember, way back when, way back when God promised Abraham he was going to have a son. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? He says to Abraham, you're going to have a huge family. You're going to be the father of all nations. And every nation is going to be blessed through you. God was revealing His plan at that point that Abraham was going to be part of the promise that brings Jesus into the world. If we look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, all people on earth will be blessed through you. You talk about putting responsibility on people. Think of the pressure. God said, I was going to do this. But no, Abraham, 25 years, I'm going to be a daddy. Yeah, right, Abraham, you're old. And you're just getting older. But he was. He was pretty soon. Isaac was born. The line had started. And this promise was beginning to come to fruition. Now, this promise uh, of salvation, the promise of the gospel, it always has been first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. 
Even Paul, in writing chapter 1 and verse 16 in Romans, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save to all who believe. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And that's why even as Paul was known as the apostle to the Gentile, Gentiles I should say, whenever he went into a town, where was the first place that he went? The Jewish synagogue. Because that was the way God designed the, the evangelism at that time. First to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. Peter's first gospel sermon was to the Jews. And he gave them a promise, like a promise they never heard under the old law. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, first of all, they'd never heard of a promise where they could be baptized and be forgiven of sins. They had to sacrifice. So that was different for them. And then he says, And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, that was something new. The gift of the Spirit was very limited before that time. I mean, if you go back and read about the building of the temple, it explains a lot of the different craftsmen and the talents they were given. It explicitly tells us that God put His Spirit up on them for that particular purpose. It's not something that was with them all the time like it is with us. Because we have that promise of the Holy Spirit given to us at baptism. But you, I need you to notice what happens while Peter is speaking to Cornelius' household. Something different. Verse 44, Acts chapter 10. While Peter was still speaking these words... The Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. This was something completely different. Peter had never seen this before. I mean, after all, when he, when he preached to the Jews back in Acts chapter 2, what did he say? Be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. Well, now they're receiving the Spirit while he's speaking. Friends, let me assure you, this was a one-time event. This was a one-time thing. It's the only time in the church that the Spirit preceded baptism. Because if you continue on and read the rest of that, what does it say? These people need to be baptized in water. Even though they had received the gift, they still had to complete what the Bible teaches, what the Scripture was telling them. They still had to be baptized. And so Peter ordered it in verse 48 that they be baptized for remission of sins. Yeah, I know when people will talk all the time and they'll try to explain to you things like baptism aren't essential for salvation. And I've even had people bring me to this verse. Look here. Look at verse... 44 in Acts chapter 10. They got the Spirit before or without baptism. I said, read verse 48. And it's the same way with the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Look, it says he was saved. Keep going. He was baptized. Just because it wasn't in the order.